Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, the first panel of today. Uh, looking forward to uh, how the United States wins the, the cyber war of 2028. 20, uh, um, before we get into the panel itself, uh, we're going to have uh, a survey round with uh, two questions just to get your sense of uh, how you're thinking of these questions. So um, if we could have the, the first question, please. I am assuming. <laughs> a question will come up shortly. So you should have uh, clickers. And uh, you can read the question, and I can't. Uh, but the uh, key thing there is, in the next decade, what cyber threat is the most dangerous to the United States national security? And uh, credit where it's due, I should say that these uh, questions are very heavily based on a, a triptych uh, created by uh, SICE professor Thomas Reid about the threats that, that the US faces. And very shortly, we will have the answer to that, I think. OK, pretty uh, conclusive, if that's true. <laughs> Sabotage is what you're all most worried about. Uh, we actually then have a second, oh, it's changing. Sabotage slightly ahead of subversion um, with uh, espionage and battlefield threats coming in relatively low down. Um, we'll let that settle. We then have a second question for you. If I could ask you to cue that up. Subtly different question, this time asking you uh, which th uh, of those threats is the United States least able to uh, manage. And again, pretty conclusive there that subversion is the one that the, uh, the US government is least uh, capable of uh, managing. And we're going to get very much into that question of subversion and disinformation as we go through this panel. So um, uh, as we get going, uh, as Albert uh, mentioned, we have a fantastic uh, lineup. Uh, just to recap, uh, Rob Lee, who is a uh, uh, New America Cybersecurity uh, Fellow, as well as being the founder and CEO of Dragos Inc., industrial control system cybersecurity company, uh, and importantly, a former Air Force officer. Uh, Jen Eastley, Managing Director, Head of Cyber Fusion at Morgan Stanley, uh, but also an ex-Army officer. Uh, we have uh, uh, Bob Schmidl, uh, Professor of Practice at Arizona State University and an ex-Marine. Well, I think you're never an ex-Marine. I think you're always a Marine. Uh, and Peter Singer, uh, who is a uh, strategist and senior fellow at New America uh, author, amongst other things, uh, of Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war. So uh, the premise of this panel is very much that um, the information technology is going to fundamentally change the character of conflict. And I think uh, um, that's sort of built into to, to many of the panels. Um, but also that, that the United States, maybe even uh, most countries around the world, uh, have, have not necessarily fully made the mental sh shift uh, to, to, to respond to that. And this, I think the premise of this panel is also that this is not necessarily just a, a military problem. Um, in order to set the scene, however, uh, I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's been writing and thinking about this for, for several years, just to give us an overview of the things that we might want to think about. Peter. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I was thinking a way of framing this is to imagine if we were gathered 10 years ago, what would we have identified as the key trends that might affect cybersecurity, cyber war in 2018, and use that as a way to look at, okay, how would we look forward 10 years? So if we had been gathered 10 years back, uh, there's 
a lot of issues we might have talked about, but I think we definitely would have talked about three. Uh, one would have been the question of intellectual property theft and our uh, adversaries stealing our secrets and how might that advantage them or not on the battlefield. That issue was just starting to percolate, be taken seriously. You had had um, major US weapons programs that had had serious breaches, et cetera. Uh, the second would have been some kind of question of uh, surveillance and privacy and what does that mean for this space. And the third, we would have uh, likely had a debate back and forth about what kind of organization do we need in this space. And we all would have said something around, well, we need something like a cyber command and this is what it should be and this should, it should be how it's structured. Now the challenge is that all three of those issues we didn't solve them over the last 10 years. Uh, intellectual property theft, you know, continues, uh, and we've now seen the fruits of uh, that campaign. You know, so the latest U.S. and Chinese stealth fighter just coincidentally look the same. Uh, surveillance privacy, what we would have argued about back in 2008, we wouldn't have mentioned uh, Edward Snowden, and we would have had a very different kind of discussion, so that problem not solved either. Um, encryption debate still with us. The uh, question of cyber command, it's here. We're having a different kind of organizational uh, debate around it. Okay, none of those have gone away, but I would offer that if we're looking at the great cyber war of 2028, there's three more that have moved to the fore that makes it even more complicated. Uh, the first issue is the complete and utter collapse of cyber deterrence. The message that Russia and every other actor received in the wake of 2016 and the campaign of attacks on the United States and all our key allies is that this works. Related to that, we have the fact that Ukraine has been treated as a battle lab for learning all of the different things that you can accomplish in this realm. And I think Rob's gonna hit that uh, really uh, importantly, but you know, again, this hits on everything from information warfare attacks alike. And uh, importantly, we've seen the crossing of key norms in targeting critical infrastructure. All sorts of things we said for the last 10 years you never ought to do, we've seen that crossed. Penetration into nuclear power plants and the like. And then finally, we have uh, the um, international efforts to build uh, cybersecurity and cyber war norms and rules of behavior and um, international institutions, those have all fallen apart. So uh, I think we, if we're looking for historic parallels, we might look at this period as akin to the Spanish Civil War, where you saw Spain in the 1930s treated as everything from a battle lab for testing new technologies, tactics, et cetera, but we also saw the message received that the international community was going to let adversaries get away with it, uh, that their activities would be um, low cost, high gain. The second thing I would toss out there is the hybridization of um, pretty much everything. So we have criminal actors being used to conduct state operations, and you know the Russian campaigns would be a great illustration of that, both targeting Ukraine, targeting the United States, you name it. We have the inverse, which is state actors being used to conduct criminal activities. So Lazarus Group coming out of North Korea conducting one of the biggest bank robberies in history. We also have the hybridization of um, realms that in the United States we separated cybersecurity information operations. Well, that's not how the rest of the world does it. They brought them together, whether you're talking about <coughs> Russia or, or, or um, China or the like, they're crashing together. So uh, the targets, um, the tactics, uh, basically all the activities are becoming hybrid. And then the third is that the internet itself is changing. We're moving to the internet of things uh, so we're not just using our smartphones to communicate, but we're looping together smart power grids, smart bases, uh, driverless cars, you name it. That's wonderful, that creates efficiency. It also massively grows the attack surface, and we're recreating all the mistakes of cybersecurity of, um, on the other side of not baking in security. And so the final happy thought I'll leave you for the great cyber war of 2028 is that we will see kinetic attacks on the Internet of Things, which will break things and which will kill people. The IoT being targeted will fundamentally change the politics of cybersecurity because all the rest of us are going to be able to wrap our heads around what it means. It's not just going to be, oh, millions of files were taken. It's going to be, 
something broke, someone died. And again, that will change the politics of it, whether you're talking about at the state, local, global level. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're now, I'm going to ask the panel to unpack some of those thoughts based on, on their expertise. Uh, then we're going to have a bit of a conversation about that, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. So please be uh, thinking about the, the questions that you would like to, to ask this panel. Um, but the um, survey showed that, that people are definitely concerned about sabotage. Peter raised uh, that. Rob, you spend your daily life worrying about the... Uh, uh, cybersecurity of the industrial Internet of Things. Over the next decade, what do we have to look forward to? Yeah, so I would largely agree with what was said and, and note that if we look at the past 10 years as it relates to industrial infrastructure, so uh, ICS and SCADA, those type of terms, uh, when you look at what has happened, it's largely been an avoidance of the issue. So we've seen a lot of good discussions about it. But a lot of the insights into actually what's been going on in those environments have been in the private sector, in those industrial networks, away from where people are collecting and monitoring. Uh, your large security companies who typically have great insight into the threats that we talk about and face and even reach into larger political discussions have always collected in enterprise business networks. That's where they have technologies and sensors and people to look and, and see what's going on. We haven't had that in industrial uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we could look at the campaigns and activity groups that were targeting uh, the, in, uh, the enterprise and getting reports like APT1, and there was no mention of industrial espionage, industrial control attacks, but they were occurring, and we can actually look back at some of that data set and see that it was there, but the expertise in the collection wasn't there. Uh, we see that now going forward as well, where it's still just starting to come up to the discussion. Uh, so taking the Ukraine discussion as well as sabotage, if we look from 2012, to 2014, just over a two year period, we saw a significant increase in targeting of US infrastructure from our strategic adversaries. But it was all preparatory type work, just looking and identifying what they could find in our infrastructure. If we then look at 2015 to 2018, uh, we have a number of concerning attacks. We had Ukraine 2015, I was fortunate enough to be one of the lead investigators on that, looked through that case and saw an adversary dedicate 20 to 30 people and a lot of resources to trying to take power down across three uh, regions of Ukraine. That was a lot of learning for them. It wasn't that they are this mythical great adversary. I think we kind of build up the adversary at times, um, but a lot of learning taking place. 2016, when they did it again, they codified it into software. So my firm identified what was called crash override. That was in essence, whatever they learned in 2015, getting put into software to make it scalable in 2016. And then in 2017, we saw TRICES, another thing that we got to be involved with um, from the defensive aspect. And, and that one hasn't gotten a lot of discussion, but I think it probably should, because it took place in, in Saudi Arabia, but it was the first piece of malware ever specifically designed to kill people. Uh, we are very fortunate people didn't die. So this 10 years from now prediction about people dying, fully support it, uh, because I was concerned that we were gonna lose life last year uh, when that capability was deployed. Uh, so what do I see and what do I see as a problem? Uh, the first of which is that when we do get these opportunities to have a more nuanced discussion in the public and maybe even set some norms, we largely abdicate our duty to it. Uh, 2015, first ever cyber attack against the power grid, what was done? Nothing. Not a single senior policy member, White House administration, anybody came out and even condemned that the attack took place. 2016, different administration, nothing. Uh, 2017, crisis. Saudi Arabia, nothing. We're setting a precedent that these attacks are actually a great investment because they don't come with the baggage that other types of conflict do. So when we give up our opportunity to influence the discussion on those key pivotal points, uh, we will end up losing our ability to have these longer, longer discussions in 2028. Uh, with the industrial internet of things and some of the technologies that are coming out, and then I'll pivot to my other panelists, <coughs> I see an over-focus on sometimes technology and buzzwords, other than actually focusing on what the mission is and what we're gonna do with it. Uh, how many of you have had to listen to pitches on AI and blockchain? If I hear how blockchain is gonna solve security one more time, I swear I'm just gonna go become a farmer. Uh, it, it is, nobody actually needs a ledger. Uh, if you want a ledger, we can show you how to get a ledger without making blockchain a thing. Uh, but we have a sort of focus, an over-focus on silver bullets. We're just gonna fix this. 
blockchain is going to revolutionize AI. Oh my gosh, we have it for offensive and defensive purposes. I, I spent my career at the, the National Security Agency. If AI was that awesome, we would have already taken advantage of it for all sorts of things. It's just machine learning. It's powerful, uh, it's useful, but it's not a panacea for these effects that we're looking towards. Uh, so I, I think we have to recognize the problems we have. Industrial is not going away. Industrial is actually the very fabric of the modern civilization we have. And uh, we have to treat it as such, and we have to treat it both as a policy, business, and technology focus, rather than thinking that, again, ignoring the problems or silver bullets are going to fix it. Thank you. Um, Jen, emerging consensus that what is going to distinguish sort of future war from previous wars is the US homeland is going to be uh, targeted, and um, cyber is going to be the sort of vector for, for that. Um, the critical infrastructure sector that has been perhaps most targeted to date is the financial sector. From where you are now, how do you see um, prospects for the next decade? Yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel. Uh, and I, I'm going to try really hard not to talk about blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, so I, I know we're looking out to the, the future war, and I thought it was a great setup from you and Peter. I thought it'd be more useful to talk a little bit about the near future and sort of how somebody who's part of the financial services sector and, and uh, critical infrastructure looks at it now. And it'll pull some threads from what Peter uh, laid out. But in terms of how we look at the threat right now, I think it's important just to kind of do a survey of the trends. If you think about just 2017, um, you think about ransomware, uh, which was a big story over the last couple of years. Some of the attacks from WannaCry to NotPetya, uh, to Bad Rabbit, obviously having um, significant impacts on people not being able to get to their data. Um, so one, one major thing. The second, uh, which was alluded to, is data breaches, um, whether that was through you know, publicly uh, released vulnerabilities that were not patched in time. Uh, we saw massive amounts of personally identifiable information, obviously Equifax, Uber, all of this has significant impacts on uh, financial services because ultimately degrades people's ability to authenticate uh, into their network. So you see PII, which is widely available on the dark web, um, and that leads to things like credential validation attacks um, against uh, certain systems that, that banks have for people to be able to log into. Um, we also um, saw the uh, distributed denial of service attacks, I think, that were alluded to, um, you know, speaking directly to lack of availability. If people can't get onto their accounts, it directly impacts the sort of credibility and the reputation um, of the bank. So that has uh, major impacts. And then what also Peter alluded to was this SWIFT, you know, um, threat actors going after the global payment system has massive impacts on Again, the credibility and the integrity of being able to move um, money. And, you know, as um, I think was alluded to, we saw the Lazarus Group or, or allegedly North Korean sponsored actors responsible for the Bank of Bangladesh attack in 2016 going after about $1 billion. They only got $81 million, but then a series of other uh, attacks against SWIFT. Um, I think that is one of the more interesting stories and trends that we see are these sort of what one might refer to as a rogue nation state actor using allegedly leaked uh, very power powerful nation state tools uh, to commit fraud or theft. Um, and you could argue, uh, you know, the other piece of that, not just Bank of Bangladesh, but the WannaCry attack, which was uh, attributed to the Lazarus Group as well, using tools like Eternal Blue or Eternal Romance uh, to do, um, you know, a ransomware attack. So, so trends that um, portend uh, a very um, increasingly and accelerating and complex and dynamic threat landscape. And even, you know, that was just sort of 2017. If you look at the, the first quarter of this year and you look at these massive uh, DDoS attacks against Arbor and GitHub, uh, you look at Meltdown and Spectre, which are vulnerabilities that affect every chip and computers. These have significant impacts on us uh, right now with respect to the financial services sector. Your point, I think, is a good one is, you know, the, the service, uh, the sector was uh, hit pretty early on. And I think, at least from just having been, you know, at Morgan Stanley for a year, what I've seen is um, some really good efforts to get ahead um, of this increasingly, as I said, complex and dynamic threat environment um, by bringing together uh, the, key, the key banks through the FSI SAC, which has been around for a while now, or through the FSARC, the Financial Systemic Analysis and Resilience Center. 
uh, which is some of the smaller banks that are very actively sharing information, which I think is, is great. But all of this, for me, at least in the, in the near future, really necessitates making sure that we not only have the right organizational structures in place, and I think there's some lessons learned from um, my most recent experience in government and counterterrorism, um, but a real emphasis on technology process and probably first and foremost, people. I think we have to get the people thing right. Um, and you know, to, to the point of the last discussion with General, uh, uh, General McConville, the need to make sure that we are very deliberately managing talent both in uh, the private sector and in the public sector and allowing for personnel policies that perhaps um, can facilitate the transfer back and forth uh, between critical infrastructure and the military or the government to sort of raise all, uh, raise all talent levels. So I'd love to talk more about that, but that's sort of the near future view of what I see. And we definitely will talk more of that. Um, Bob, um, since uh, you retired uh, from the uh, military, I know you've been thinking about this issue in, in various ways, um, but, but just very specifically for the purposes of our opening remarks, uh, I wondered if you might talk a little bit about the, the threats to the deployed force. The, the, there is um, a, a natural um, desire to talk about homeland security threats, um, but you know, Peter wrote a best-selling book sort of saying that cyber is actually a, a big issue for the military. How, are, are we in danger of forgetting that in, in focusing on all of the, the, the threats to infrastructure in the financial sector? Um, okay, so I think what we, what we ought to do is to start with the way that we think about warfare, right? So when we say, when we even talk about the future of war, I would suggest that one of the things that we are not going to have the luxury of is having a clearly defined line between when we're at peace and when we're at war. And so just, you know, from my experience doing this, you know, the first night of Desert Storm when we all lined up on the runway at Sheikh Issa with our lights off, as soon as you plugged in the afterburners, you knew that everything had changed. It was going to change. The ROE was different. Things were different. We were at war and we were going to treat the way that we were behaving in a different manner. That's not going to happen, I don't believe. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that we are actually at war right now. And it is, this, it is the war of ideas that has, so you can tell I come from New England, right? So we put ours on the end of the word. So. It, it's the, it, it is, you, the thing is, you can kill people, and we do that, and we found some really efficient and effective ways to do that over the years, but what you can't kill are ideas. And so, you know, the whole purpose of propaganda, for example, is to influence a, an outcome without resorting to physical violence. So if we think about the future, what I would, what I would suggest is that it is, the war is not going to be declared. We already see the Russians talking about this from Gerasimov and others that have begun to say that in, in the future wars will not be declared. They will simply be an increase in the level of violence. So if, the, if we are at war now, our general, our, our notion of what it means to be at war is something that I think we need to examine and that we need to think about how we're gonna fight this war of ideas. How are we going to be able to counter disinformation, to counter weaponized information? To how is it that we are going to be able to do that? If the purpose of disinformation is, and I would suggest it actually is not the content of that disinformation that is most important, that the purpose of that is to create a social bond among people that will then believe what it is inside of that micro world that they're being told. And this is the, the understanding why people seem to believe things in spite of the fact that all the evidence points to a different, uh, a different answer. You know, there's, a, there's a, a famous American philosopher named Groucho Marx who once said in a, in a movie called Duck Soup, if you ever get a chance to, to, to watch this, after some event occurs, you know, Groucho takes the cigar out of his mouth and looks and he says to, to this guy and he said, so who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? So, so, so just think about that because what, what's happening now is that we are subjectively, and we have been for years, interpreting the things that happen out there. In, and we haven't accounted for the, the way that bots accelerate the disinformation that comes out 
the way that people take in information, that so much more of it now is coming through things like Facebook that tailors that information in a way that begins to reinf or simply reinforces your worldview. So to the, to the point that Peter made earlier, I fully agree that there are some really Gucci technical capabilities that cyber is going to give us today, it has today, and, and into the future. The kinetic effects of cyber, again, I, I don't think that that's where we ought to be focused as we think about the future of warfare. We ought to be focused on the war of ideas and how it is that we are going to counter the narratives that are out there now, how we're going to deal with narratives that, that actually are um, having an effect on our view of the world, right? our enlightenment view of the world, that we think that if all rational people can sit down and observe the same facts, that we'll come to the same answers. We can't even agree on what the facts are. We, you know, we, we have a, you know, people talk about a post or alternative facts, about a post-factual, a post-truth world. Um, it, it, I don't think that that's necessarily all c completely accurate, but there has been, you know, with the advent of postmodernism, we, more and more people believe that truth comes from those that have the power to be able to say what is and what is not true. And so when we think about that, and we think about the, the fact that we just spent the last century uh, trying to uh, defeat two totalitarian governments, right? the Nazis and the, and the Soviet Union, and the resurgent Russia that's out there today, we ought to be thinking about how those governments came to be, especially in countries that, were, that had such a deep history, in the case of Germany, of Enlightenment philosophy. So again, I think it's the war of ideas. I think we need to think about that. We need to think about narratives, and we need to think about the fact that in that the history of the human race, we've not really been successful at killing ideas, not nearly as successful as we've been about killing each other. And, and I would suggest that the war is it's happening now. There's not, we're not gonna have a big bright day where you're gonna get up and all of a sudden everything's gonna be offline. That may happen, but that is, is, is the end result, I would, uh, I would argue, of a larger and more insidious change in the way that we think about for instance, this still this great experiment of ours in, uh, in constitutional democracy. So, go ahead. Peter, you spent the last two years thinking about many of these issues, uh, writing a book that we will all get to read in October. But um, um, g give us a sort of sense of uh, uh, w where your research has told you about what we need to worry about out sort of now and uh, over the next decade on the the issue of sort of social media and disinformation in warfare. Sure, so the, the project, you know, Ian, if you're gonna plug it, you gotta plug the name of it. Um, the, and it but it actually aligns really well with what the journal laid out. It's a, a book project called Like War uh, that'll be out in October. And it's a play on the idea of uh, we're seeing realms uh, where war and politics are coming together. Uh, so we are winning elections using information warfare techniques in turn, ISIS is winning battles by using the same uh, digital marketing that Taylor Swift does. And so they're all crashing together. And um, I think if we're looking at the future of this space, um, I see again that parallel to the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. You know, we've, we've spent the last couple of years experiencing um, what you can do with fake accounts uh, what you can do with the influence of sock puppets, whether you know that's humans posing as someone else or bots. We've seen the impact of fake news. Um, and again, whether it's changing battlefield outcomes in Syria and Iraq, or it's potentially uh, or arguably changing election outcomes. Uh, there's a really interesting study that just came out of Ohio State that looked at what exposure to fake news did to voter turnout in the 2016 election. And um, basically, it depressed previous people who had previously voted for Obama if they were exposed to fake news like Pope endorses Donald Trump. Uh, it brought it down uh, voter turnout for them by 2%, which uh, if you crunch the numbers uh, actually was enough to swing things. Um, but 
if we're looking to the future, what worries me is to go back to this um, idea of hybridization. So it's not something that's completely fake. It's the melding of what's fake and real. Uh, which makes it more effective. And um, this is known, uh, particularly when you look at the video side, as deep fakes. Uh, and like so much of the, the internet, this uh, comes out of two places. It comes out of the porn industry and university labs. Um, so if we've got a picture here, this is where someone melded the real face of um, Gal Gadot Versano, who's the star of Wonder Woman, onto the body of a porn star, uh, making it seem as if she appeared in a movie that she definitively did not appear in. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, um, you can uh, also not just uh, meld, but change. This is from a University of Washington experiment where they were able to synthesize a presidential speech that never happened. So you could make Barack Obama or anyone else if you've got approximately 30 uh, visual data points, which through social media you don't just get 30, you get literally thousands. You can make them essentially say what you want them to say. Um, next slide. Uh, so we're just now starting to get a taste of this in our politics. This is from an Instagram that uh, the young survivors of the Parkland mass killing made uh, where they're advocating for uh, gun control. And um, if you can go to the next slide, very quickly it was uh, changed to make it appear as if she did something that she didn't. So if you saw she was tearing up a target and quickly it was made to appear as if she is tearing up the Constitution. That was conducted, that was coordinated via um, social media uh, and then it was driven viral by a mix of um, alt-right, and uh, Russian bots and the like. So, sounds familiar. And um, my point in all of this is that uh, we, US government, need to understand this is a weapon. This is a weapon that will be used against US democracy and the US military. It is a weapon that will be far more important and far more effective than many of the real weapons that concern us, as well as many of the fake ones like EMP that get a lot of attention. And so we need to start to do R&D on how to rapidly identify and debunk and defeat this kind of weapon that's going to hit us, that's been proven to be effective. And in turn, it can't just be on the US military, the US government to figure this out. It also is on the platform firms to figure out um, how do they prepare their, their networks for this weapon being used on them? Um, are they gonna need to, a little bit parallel to the s financial sector, come up with the equivalent of like credit card, you know, uh, the ability to mark transactions, hashes. Um, maybe this is actually where blockchain will be effective. Digital hashing will do the whole thing for you without blockchain, but that's- We'll hear on that. Yeah. <laughs> but then it's also, the third part is um, it's on the media to figure out what are they gonna do about this weaponization? Are they gonna enable it or not? Which again, was the exact same question they didn't ask themselves when, for example, foreign actors hacked people in the American political establishment, weaponized it to hit our democracy. They didn't go, hold it, am I gonna help this battlefield action from another side? So this is, I think, gonna kinda, you know, I would have said it's 2028, but, I think we're gonna see it starting in, you know, maybe as soon as, I mean, we saw the micro version here. What's it gonna look like in the 2018 election? What's it gonna look like in the 2020 election? How is it gonna be used against US operations, be them in Syria or the like? So my job in all of this is to keep the panelists on point. So returning to our question of uh, what it takes to uh, win cyber wars, and even that concept is a little bit uh, debatable. Um, what does this actually mean for the distinction between civilians and the military? I mean, the, the consistent message from what you said is that, that we're seeing a blurring of responsibilities. We, we have a new um, cybercom commander, NSA director coming in. What, what should he make his job and how should that be different from what you, know, you Rob, you Jen, Mark Zuckerberg should be, should be worrying about? Great way to clump us in with Mark, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Uh, still no blockchain would be great, uh, but w what does it actually look like for the military? So I, I think about this a lot, I get asked this a lot uh, from my military peers. 
And I would say we have to figure out whose lane in the road goes to what problem. I see a lot of effort and resources continually wasted by very well-intentioned groups, each claiming ownership of the exact same problem, and then debating between themselves to fix it. Uh, I gave a Senate testimony recently on what we needed to do for infrastructure security. And one of my big positions is when it comes to the government, they need to stop, and this can get into a political discussion, but stop going out to executives at like power companies saying, we can do your incident response and your services and your defense for free when a cyber attack happens. Um, even if you legally could, which there are debates, uh, you're not well resourced for it, nor do you have the skills to do it um, at scale. And so getting ready to give this testimony was interesting to me that I had DOE, DHS, DOD, and National Guard uh, components uh, each reach out to me to complain about each other, hoping that it would get into my Senate testimony about why they shouldn't do it and how they should. And my position is actually all of you should stop uh, going out and advertising this capability. So uh, when it comes to the role of, of these government agencies and private sector, there's a ton of very well-intentioned people with very good skills that each have a role to play, but there are certain things the private sector can do. There are certain things the private sector is better at. Knowing what's in their networks and training and defending their networks, they are better at. Going and making hard policy statements against the Russian state and being able to wage Title 10 or Title 50 kind of conflict and intelligence, they're not as good at, nor they should be good at it. Um, there are purposeful roles of government, military, DHS, DOE, et cetera, and we need to make sure we play to the strengths. One of my concerns for 2028 is well-intentioned uh, groups having a butterfly effect and killing those local economies. Good example of this goes back to the infrastructure debate. Uh, right now, there are many National Guard units, not all of them, many of them are all right on point where they should be, um, but many of them have gone out to conferences that I've gone to and said, we will do instant response. When the cybers happen, call me, and we'll come in and do instant response for you. And then you ask them their plan, their familiarity with that type of control equipment, how, how many times have you operated a, a high energy transformer, any of these kind of discussions, and it falls apart. Um, but then what happens is the power company owners don't go to the instant response firms that are actually building those skill sets, coming up with innovation and figuring how to do that. They think, nope, I've got this, call the CERT, call the DHS number, that's my instant response plan. So what it in effect does is it kills that expertise in the community that should be coming up against these threats and becoming quite literally battle hardened. Um, I have, I'll give one more that sounds like a complaint, but it's really just a warning. I have seen, I have better intelligence today on industrial control system threats at my firm than I had at the NSA when I ran the mission. It has nothing to do with people and capabilities, it has to do with being in those networks to collect that data and having well-skilled people outside of bureaucracy. The problem is, even when I publish a nice intelligence report to our customers and folks, it will take about three weeks for it to come back to me as a classified report with our logos removed from it, claiming that the government found it. Um, that actually has introduced problems for me twice, uh, where it actually almost led to FBI type investigations, thinking that we stole classified data when we were actually the original source of it. Um, this is an actual big issue. If you wanna talk about building skill sets up, and having capabilities of people in your communities who can actually do security. My concern for 2028 is people not sticking to lanes where they actually focus on problems and instead when they run into challenges, pivoting because they're really good people. Pivoting to something easier that actually the place where private sector can and should be in. Uh, Save mill rolls. Yeah, just to your point on Cybercom, um, I, I guess I'd say a couple things. Um, you mentioned the new vision statement that's out there. Uh, and I'll say up front, um, I am personally very excited about uh, Paul Nakasone, um, uh, if and when he gets confirmed, taking over both uh, NSA and Cybercom. I think there's nobody better for that job, nobody more experienced, both on the signals intelligence side as well as the cyber side, and exactly the right person uh, to take over that job and to grapple with the tough questions of how do we continue to build capacity and capability and um, the elevation to the unified command, the question of whether they split the dual hats uh, that was put together you know, almost 10 years ago when I worked with him on uh, the Cybercom I team. I think one of the things uh, that they're gonna need to spend a lot of time on within that vision statement, it talks about things like resiliency, which I think we can all agree with, uh, but a more sort of active defense um, and a uh, constant contesting of the adversary. And so really figuring out what that means and then operationalizing that, you know, both from a military perspective, which I won't weigh in on because it's been a while, but um, in terms of their relationship with uh, critical infrastructure, I think is something 
that we need to figure out, not 2028, but as we've all been sort of circling around, these are current threats, these are things we're gonna need to deal with in the very near term, whether it has to do with information operations that not only can affect our democracy, but can also move markets in a pretty significant way. Um, these are things we're gonna need to figure out how to develop that pretty strong connective tissue between uh, the government and various facet facets of the government, where the capability and capacity lie, but where the right legal authorities and the policy framework, um, I think still, again, having been away from it for a little bit, could use some, uh, some focus, frankly, um, and then to figure out, again, how we develop this relationship with all the critical infrastructure sectors to make sure that if there are um, significant attacks, that we have a capability to work hand in hand to you know, ultimately defend the nation. Well, the, the, Sorry, the, go ahead, Bill. Just, just, add, just add, uh, to pile onto that for a minute. So if, if we agree that perhaps that the threat that we face in the future is, is a threat to the, to the narrative, if you will, that we tell ourselves about this democracy and about how this country operates, about what's of value to us, how is it that you are then going to, if, if that's sort of the, quote, non-traditional way of looking at this, how do you focus an organization like the United States Cyber Command on that kind of a threat? Um, in the case of a National Guard unit, how does a, you know, what is an, how does a National Guard unit in State X respond to a request to ensure that their voting system is in fact secure? And when they discover that it's not just the sort of moat security, right? So we all know that that's not that's not the good visualization. I mean, the, the, the big challenge is that there is no longer a home game and an away game, right? It's just the game and it includes everything. So as, as we think about defending those kinds of things that are of value to us in, the, in our infrastructure, part of which is this, this or I would suggest the, the, the heart of it is the information that's out there. How do we, organize ourselves to be able to do that, given what Jen just said, which is absolutely the challenge today, given the authorities that are stovepiped in every way, shape, and form that you can imagine to align with the stovepiping of the organizations. The line between what the Department of Homeland Security would do in the event of an attack on the critical infrastructure and what Cybercom might do, in spite of the fact that we've been having this discussion for well nigh 10 years now, eight years, we still don't have a clearly defined, at least in the minds of, of many of the folks that are gonna be called upon, a, a distinction or a delineation between where that line would be, given that historically what we have seen in places for natural disasters, like think Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, whatever, that when bad things like that happen at scale, the U.S. military is generally called upon to come do something. No one knows quite what that is, and we ride to the sound of the guns, and away we go. So how, how we think about that, even just being able to react to something like that, and then, but the more important question is, how do we think about proactively um, dealing with this? If you know the bots are in certain places, and you know that they are bot farms that are owned by organizations that have an affiliation with government X, what is the authority, what is the, what ought the authorities be, what would the role of Cyber Command be in doing something about that? Um, and how we make the distinction between whether we're gonna turn those things, whether we're gonna send them to Mars, whether we're gonna do something else, um, it remains to be seen. And, uh, but I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's stepping back from what we've traditionally seen as the mission of the United States Cyber Command and thinking more broadly, strategically about how this threat that has become so evident here in the last few years that with regard to the, what information has done uh, to affect, if you will, some of the things that have been happening in the world. And the very last thing I would say is that any discussion about this has got to go back to the weakest link in this thing. So like cybersecurity, we realize that the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain is us, it's the operators, right? The weakest link in this chain of disinformation is also us. You know, we, we, we tend to forget that uh, if any of you have a chance to Google this thing, Orson Welles played the War of the Worlds, right? From the Mercury Theater in the 1930s. And three different times during that thing, during that 40 minutes, they came on, stopped and said, 
this is only a drill. This is, a, this is made up, it's fixed, and yet it caused widespread panic in New Jersey. Now, it could have been because it was in New Jersey, I don't know, but, <laughs> but, but nonetheless. So. Peter, the general said the sort of $64 million question, what, what's the answer, what should the strategy be? The answer in so much of cybersecurity is uh, WWED, what would Estonia do? And by that I mean um, whether it is the strategy of building a digital economy, but thinking about security as you build it, uh, and a convenient digital economy, a lot more convenient than, than ours, to a strategy of resilience, understanding that threats will, you can't stop threats from hitting you, it's how do you um, become resilient to them, so kind of this overall strategic thinking, to uh, creating organizations to fill gaps. So, you know, I'm in complete agreement with the idea that we need to make the transfer of knowledge between private sector and government or active duty military a lot easier, but there's also, at the end of the day, uh, and I think Rob also touched on this, there's only mo so much capacity, only so much expertise that you can um, locate within government or the military. So we've built up National Guard capability, but at the end of the day, uh, to, serve in the, to serve in the military, to serve in the National Guard, you have to meet a set of physical requirements that the previous general mentioned not everyone meets. You have to meet a series of criminal background and um, you know, what you can smoke or not. To, you have to, to join the National Guard, even as a cyber expert, you have to be willing to say, yeah, I'm a cyber expert, but if you need me to deploy to Iraq or earthquakes in Haiti, I'll have to go. Um, so that does not solve our human capacity problem, and Estonia has a model called the Cyber Defense League uh, that um, allows civilians to uh, aid government on a volunteer basis. The parallel in the United States is the Civil Air Patrol, which was actually created during World War II to fill gaps that the um, U.S. military couldn't meet. So it was doing things like uh, submarine patrols to ferrying planes to teaching kids. And again, the parallel here for a cyber version of this is doing everything from red teaming to helping with incident response to um, just like the Civil Air Patrol, reaching out to schools and universities to aid in training or to draw people in. So I think we need to be creative in building up um, other organizations that gap fill and do do it in a uh, very cheap uh, manner. So if you look at the Civil Air Patrol, it's something like a budget of like 60 million. Um, and again, I think there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more that can be done in this space. But to go back to um, what Rob was laying out, the challenge for it is everyone can't think that they own this problem. And that's been one of the, um, uh, for all the capability building at Cyber Command or within the National Guard, we've also seen a resistance to alternative structures that, that might aid more capacity building. So I'm gonna open this up to the floor in a second, but just before we do, I wanna touch on that talent point. We have um, several uh, examples of sort of the, the US military sort of cyber talent now doing its um, business in, in the private sector here on the panel, uh, let alone uh, in, in the audience and, and elsewhere. Um, firstly, how do we make sure we're generating the right talent in the private sector, in, in the military? And, and second, how do we make sure that it, it, it is deployed in the right place? Either you know, all of the talent doesn't get sucked out into the private sector or, or, or we're kind of you know, trying to do things in the military that, that could be done uh, better in the private sector. Ian, yeah, maybe, maybe we ought to think about this structurally a little bit differently. So we talk about talent moving from the military into the private sector, so maybe the way to look at it is to say, all right, so is that such a bad thing? And maybe we ought to look at the mission space, right? So, you know, Cyber Command has three missions. As you know, it, it defends, it operates and defends the gig, and it does some other full spectrum, yak yak, whatever the euphemism of the day is. Maybe on the defensive side, we think about um, pushing a lot of that out of government, and we think about sending that using the commercial sector to do much of that sort of blocking and tackling stuff, which would now free up uh, assets and, re and resources to use against some of the other missions that Cybercom might do. So there's, 
I, there's, there's just a couple different ways I think that we could we might be able to, to, to look at this in a little asymmetrically that might actually be useful. Rob, I think that's your cue. Yeah, so I, I would agree. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we've seen this already where uh, the various military services are talking about outsourcing certain aspects of IT to like Amazon. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there are expertise that has become commoditized, that's scalable, and the private sector has um, knowledge on how to do, and I think we should think about the problem differently. Because there is a role for everybody, and there's a lot of smart talent, as mentioned, and we just kind of have to play to those strengths. When I think of workforce development specifically for the government, uh, I, I don't really push back on like weight changes. Like I'm a fairly fluffy guy after I got out, and I still don't think that anybody should welcome me back in uniform like this. Like let's not change uh, the military because we think <laughs> cyber experts only come in one flavor. It's just not true. Uh, I, I would say there's a lot of adages actually that we cling to and a lot of cliches that we cling to that are just not true. Uh, the attacker has to get it right once, but defenders have to get it right all the time. That's stupid and wrong. Uh, the, the idea that uh, we can't detect novel attacks, so that's completely throwing away the idea of an investigation during a kill chain kind of effect. Uh, there's all these things that we cling to. One of them that I constantly hear is, well, people are leaving the military because uh, they get paid more in the private sector. And that's not why I left. It's not why most of my peers left. Uh, most of the folks that I see leaving leave because of mission. Uh, you can't have a lack of culture, a lack of mission, and a lack of pay. You know, pick one or two. But if you have all three, you're, you're going to lose your folks. Uh, so when, I, I mean, and I'm in no way cynical. If you cut me, I still bleed red, white, and blue in coffee. But if you look at the military today, there, there's an overappreciation on capabilities and an underappreciation of people. Uh, that, that, sh that sort of pendulum swing is going to have forced you to lose a lot of people. Uh, there is consistently an, uh, a focus on putting leadership as a skill. I, I don't know who started that on terms of like, well, he's a pilot. He should be in charge of cyber. Like, why? He has no skills uh, for cyber. Well, he's a, he's a leader. That, that, that doesn't make any sense to your folks that are trying to come up the ranks. I wrote a paper years ago actually pushing back against Michael Daniel, no offense to Michael Daniel, uh, when he came out and said, well, uh, it's great that I had no technical capabilities that it kept me out of the weeds. Well, you just de-incentivized everybody in that whole chain of people growing up to go get a business degree instead of cyber skills because apparently that's what leadership looks like. And we, gotta, we gotta incentivize people differently. I think that's the workforce challenge the military is gonna have. Personnel and procurement system, fix those and you'll fix a lot of the challenges from pilots to cyber. Jen, you recruit out of the military for your uh, current role. How do you see the talent piece? Yeah, um, on the leadership piece, I don't know if that's unique to Air Force. Um, it's very Air I, Force thing. I, um, <laughs> I had a different experience in the Army, so we don't need to go into that in detail, but I think leadership is, um, you know, core to the importance of, you know, across the branch of the Army. But to the point about uh, the talent management piece, just to pick up on one thing you said, I, I don't necessarily think people are leaving, um, and I'm not just talking about military, and we can just choose to talk National Security Agency, because we both have some background in that, but even civilians who are leaving for one reason or another, they're not leaving for the money necessarily, but you know, the truth of the matter is the private sector does pay more money. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm getting at in terms of how do, we, how do we look at personnel policies of if somebody does go out and work in the private sector, particularly in the critical infrastructure sector, which I think is, you know, a good thing for the nation. It's part of our economic security with respect to finance. If we wanted them to come back in for one reason or another or to be able to move back and forth, I think those are the types of things that we need to figure out how to crack the code on that. Um, and so, but, but from a larger standpoint, you know, I spend probably 60 to 70 percent of my time on talent management in my current job. When you think about it, negative percent unemployment for cybersecurity skills, to me, it comes down to sort of a little bit echoing what Rob just said about, you know, culture. You didn't use that word, but I think it is creating the right culture, whether it be in the military or whether it be in the intelligence community or in the private sector, so that people uh, feel incentivized uh, to solve really tough technical problems and let alone by good leadership to be able to do that, empowered to do it so that they can be take initiative and have their risks underwritten and be innovative. And also I think what is really important, and we don't have a ton of time to talk about this, but is you know inclusion and diversity. I, I think to get to your, the, your question, Peter, it's start very young because you know, getting to the elementary school, whether it's you know, the Cyber Civilian Air Patrol or Cyber Peace Corps or Cyber Teach for America, we need to be able to tap into a much larger portion across all of our, um, of, across all of our kids to include um, young women. Because uh, I think ultimately at the end of the day, 
you know, the data shows that more inclusive, more diverse organizations are more efficient, more productive, more effective. And so I spend a lot of my time figuring out how to make a more diverse uh, organization. There's a great new book uh, written by uh, General Dempsey and Ori Brockman called Radical Inclusion, which actually talks about some of the things you said with a war of ideas. You know, it's, it's John Adams says, uh, you know, facts are stubborn things, but facts don't really matter that much anymore. It's all about the war of, for the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the contention of the book is we can win the war of the narrative if we uh, develop a more inclusive culture. Thank you. Um, I know other people have comments on that, but I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, if you have a question, please put your uh, hand straight up, and we'll take three questions as, as a group. So um, let's uh, start over here. Good morning. I'm uh, Colonel Scott Heath with the United States Air Force. We talked earlier about the ability or the lack of responses to any type of cyber attack. Do you think it's a matter or a challenge that it is becoming more difficult to ID the attacker, whether it be a non-state or a private entity, or is it more of a factor of risk averse because if you do get that wrong and you're able to ID, what's the challenge if it doesn't turn out to be what we thought it was? Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll group these questions just so we have a chance. So, um, gentlemen at the, in the blue shirt at the towards the back. Captain Robert Robinson, U.S. Army. Um, I just had a, a question in particular. Uh, everyone touched on either uh, video manipulation or power grid um, and cybersecurity with financial, but uh, I didn't hear anything in specific about supply chain management or logistics and how like false requisition would be a big issue uh, on a global scale. Thank you, and uh, one other front here. Hi, Matt Ryan from the Council for Emerging National Security Affairs. Um, you talked about the potential for private sector to contribute to these problems, but history has shown that private sector can't always impose the stick. So you talked about carrots, but there's not a stick. Um, Richard Clark used the, the comparison of an oil spill or an environmental disaster for how some of these vulnerabilities are being treated in the private sector. Isn't there a need for the government to step in and punish those who are needlessly creating vulnerabilities in this space? So three questions. One, uh, identification of attackers, I guess attribution. Uh, second, supply chain cybersecurity. And um, uh, third, um, the role of the government to sort of hold the private sector to account uh, for vulnerabilities, but also, I guess, to, to enable them to, to, to do other things. Jump in as you see fit. You, so if the question about attribution depends on who you talk to. It's either very difficult or not so very difficult. Um, the response to that uh, in whether or not there is risk, it depends. One of the things that I think we ought to think about, though, is not necessarily thinking about responding to a cyber event with another cyber event, that we ought to think about responding to a cyber event by any means that we deem necessary, which obviously gives you more attack service, it gives you a more asymmetric approach, and that's really, I think, what, what you're after. Part of the issue that you're raising, though, at least in my experience, has been that a lot of the people that are trying to make decisions about the actions or the reaction to something that's happened have not taken the time to educate themselves in even the basic technology to, have, to understand exactly what it is that's happening to them, to their networks, to their infrastructure. Uh, and I'm not talking about making computer scientists out of them. I'm simply talking about actually having them come to the level where they can understand this. Uh, I don't know what you do in the Air Force, but if you're a pilot, for example, uh, not every pilot that I know, certainly I'm not, is an aeronautical engineer. Yet we all have some basic understanding of aerodynamics and why airplanes do the things that they do. That level of understanding with regard to cyber uh, in the world of cyber is, is something that I've seen to be sort of spotty, I guess. And I'll, I'll take the uh, supply chain uh, question. Uh, we need to reframe our thinking. Our supply chain is now a battlefield. Um, and it's a battlefield in uh, at least two potential ways. One is if you look at the scenarios, whether it's uh, Russia in Eastern Europe or uh, China in the Pacific, uh, there's um, power in a, in a direct defeat, but there's also uh, power in just simply slowing down our deployment enough 
to create a fait accompli. Uh, I seize territory X or I take action Y and the United States doesn't show up within the day, it's delayed for a week or the like. And going after our supply chain, going after the civilian companies that our military depends on to deploy, going after GPS, not just to make the Navy ship think that it's in the wrong place, but to make the um, the package uh, uh, hit the wrong place. Um, changing the package so that instead of uh, ammunition, toilet paper arrives uh, by the barcode. All of that has an effect that could um, shift the battle and allow the other side to win simply by delaying the, uh, the normal efficient workings of our supply chain. The second um, idea of it being a battleground is hitting the supply chain during um, the design or manufacturing process. Uh, that is creating flaws in the technology itself. So we've seen stealing of intellectual property, but you may also see the insertion of flaws, um, hardware hacks, so to speak, so that uh, those microchips that uh, you bought on scale and then deployed into your weapons on scale what happens when they don't work the way that you planned. And again, what hits, you know, I think a theme of this is that battle, the effect of it might happen um, two years from now, uh, but the, the most important battle uh, happened in phase zero. That is, the, the war might have been won two years before the war ever began. Jen, Rob? Yeah, I was just, I was really gonna mention what Peter mentioned, just I, I talked about not Petya earlier, which is a great example of a supply chain attack that you know, had hundreds of millions of dollars of impact and rippled, you know, operationalized through MEDOC accounting software. So couldn't agree more that that's another sort of major trend. And we certainly look at, um, from a vendor perspective, um, you know, it's as important as our weakest point, frankly. Uh, to your point about um, regulation and, and legislation and all that, I would just comment if you look at some of the things that the SEC is doing to specifically hold corporations accountable, um, potentially related to coming out of the Equifax, um, uh, the way that Equifax dealt with their breach, I think they are looking um, to, to basically inflict um, or to, I don't want to use the word inflict, sort of create greater uh, incentives uh, for the private sector. Um, to be able to to be more active in terms of dealing with uh, vulnerabilities and then also the GDPR, which will go into effect in May, has a real impact in terms of uh, corporations and firms that operate outside the U.S. in terms of how we deal with privacy. And so another example of just how we're going to be, um, you know, how we're going to need to shift uh, what we do based on um, government norms. So we're pretty much at the end of the time, so I'm going to ask uh, Rob to come in and uh, just answer those three questions, and then I'm going to get, put you on warning that I'm going to come down the row and ask each of the panelists for the one-sentence view of what the U.S. needs to do differently to be uh, ready for the challenges of the next decade. This is obviously going to be much shorter, so <laughs> knowing the attacker, not important at all for defense. It's important for strategic purposes. If I'm doing instant response or investigations, it can actually hurt the baggage that comes with attribution and thinking differently in the network. 99% of your instant response is before the attack happens. It's all the preparatory work and the investigations capital that needs to be put in. Therefore, under any model, people showing up to site to fix it after the fact is always a losing strategy. On the discussion of supply chain, still not a use case for blockchain. Uh, if we are going from <laughs> a, identifying where it came from, where it went, you can still use digital hashing. The whole discussion is much broader than security of it. I think they hit it very well with the um, supply chain aspect of our of our suppliers and being attacked by foreign governments. I was actually very happy to see seven leading nations come out and do attribution on the NotPetya attack and, and talk about economic sanctions, something different than a cyber attack um, back at them. I do think that imposes great costs on the security of our supply chain. That's where government has a role. Uh, software downloading and hashing it to make sure it's validated, any company can do that. Knowing that the Cisco router didn't get intercepted along the way before it went to your facility, uh, there's a really good role for government to be involved in that. On the aspect of regulations, make sure that you are setting a base standard. It's hard to define what base looks like. Um, the idea, though, is to always make sure it's incentivized and community structure more so than punishment. The moment you utter the word punishment and regulation, you're going to have better lobbyists on the other side. Uh, so when it comes to regulation, figure out what we need to set as a base and understand that any level of regulation can't regulate away future problems. It can only help us be more defensible against the problems we know about. Okay, one sentence uh, is what you're allowed. What is the one thing we ought to do to prepare for the next decade? Rob. It has to absolutely be focused on workforce development. 
um, people are always going to be your best portion of this. Jen? We'll be boring and say continue to invest in human capital because it's the most important thing that we can do. Cool. Thank you. Paul? So the one thing that we don't do well is we don't teach critical thinking skills in this country. And Marie and I were at a conference last week and a professor from Columbia had just done a study on fake news and where it was coming from, right? It was the, the target audience, the biggest offenders were 65 years of age and older and they were getting their news through Facebook. So critical thinking isn't something you just learn in school and then forget about. It's something that you probably ought to remember as you get older. But again, I understand memory's not quite as good, so maybe that's the way it happened. <laughs> Peter, final word. Lightly tapping someone's wrist that has already been lightly slapped will not change the lesson that Russia and every other actor out there took that cyber attacks on the United States and its allies are incredibly low cost, high gain. Thank you very much. Um, before I go, I want to give a quick plug uh, to pick up Jen's point about women in cybersecurity inclusion for New America's Humans of Cybersecurity blog. We're very focused on this issue. We'd like to give more visibility to that. And uh, date yet arranged, but I want to invite you all to come to the event that I know we must organize between uh, Rob Lee and our blockchain uh, trust accelerator, <laughs> which will come up sometime in the next few months. But for now, I'd like to thank Rob Lee, Jenny Easterly, Bob Schmidl, and Peter Singer. Thank you very much. <laughs>